So I have to warn you. So the last time I did a talk in a pub, it was in Canada. And famously, the Canadians are both very drunk and very friendly. And famously, the British, of course, are drunk but not so friendly. <laughs> so I feel that a challenge has been put forward to you. So, um, as was just said, I work at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. We're interested in, you know, like maybe the humans shouldn't go extinct. You might want to disagree about that. That's for question time. Um, this morning, there was the existential risk version of a bunch of klaxons going off, which was I kind of got into work, and there's a bunch of emails from our administrator saying, so there's this article that people want us to comment on, and the article is from the Daily Mail, which uh, you, you feel a bit worried about. So here's the article that was published today. Doomsday AI will cause nuclear war by 2040. They could destroy humanity, and there may be no way to prevent it. It's a very kind of exciting kind of thing. Now, what this is based on is an article from the RAND Corporation, who actually, you know, do pretty good work. We're pointing out something which people thinking about existential risk have thought about for a long time, which is roughly this. We have all of these systems which kind of sort of work, kind of, given humans. So, for instance, if two superpowers have a fuck ton of nuclear weapons, they're kind of aware that if you shoot them, I'll, you'll, they'll probably shoot them back. And so there's this kind of mutually assured destruction that you can kind of work out using game theory, blah, blah, blah. But if these things start being controlled by artificial intelligence, particularly by things like machine learning, where it's very hard to actually understand why they do the things what they do, it's extremely unclear whether or not those systems which have wor worked for, say, 50 years, we've just been very lucky, um, are going to continue working. And so the RAND Corporation have just kind of pointed this out. What I slightly love about this article is it kind of hits all of the things I want to be worried about today. One is, for instance, apparently it's going to be by 2040, which is very specific. <laughs> right, there's a certain grandness to it. So as soon as I started reading this, I was like, so where's the Terminator? There it is. And just <laughs> go down a little bit, picture of a Terminator. We're going to end with a whole bunch of pictures of Terminators. These are apparently the way we should think about artificial intelligence. Um, so the thing I kind of want to talk about is put existential risk on the table and think about it. Think about the kinds of, I'm going to use the word epistemic, which is a philosophy word meaning knowy, knowing stuff. Right? How it's really hard to know stuff about existential risks. And then I'm going to complain a little bit about the ways in which we think about existential risk kind of at a public and policy level. Right? And so, to an extent, the tech stuff here is going to be pretty minimal. And you guys can nerd out at me during question time, which seems fair. So I'm going to do three things today. The first is I'm going to introduce this notion of existential risk and then talk about how it's really hard to know existential risk. Then I'm going to talk about science. I'm going to say some things that are very negative about science. You mustn't think I don't love science. I love science dearly. That's why this is tough love. Tough love for science. Right? And then I'm going to take this wild change of topic and talk about storytelling. And I'm going to try and suggest that actually there's something crucial about storytelling and narrative that we kind of, as a, I don't know, what's the right way to show it? As a people, as a civilization, as a species we need to get a handle on if we're going to lead ourselves into good futures rather than horrible shitty futures. So that's how today's going to work. So who's heard of existential risk before? Eh, about half of you. Okay, good. So usually when people say existential risk, they mean human extinction. But I'm a philosopher, so I have to be more fancy than that. So here's my more fancy philosopher version of what existential risk is. Usually, when people talk about risk, they think about it in terms of a kind of quantified scale. So for instance, this is very bad, assuming this is Earth or some planet that we care about. This is less bad. All right, and I'm just spilling some milk. Typically, you might try and characterize the kind of risk here on a scale from not really catastrophic to like super uber catastrophic. And what do you mean by catastrophic? You mean something like uh, maybe number of lives lost, amount of money it's going to cost, the time it's going to take to recover, right? It's this kind of quantified scale. What's interesting to me about existential risk is I don't think it's about that. Existential risk is about the existence of some entity. It's not about this quantity. It's about this thing that we care about. For instance, this person is putting themselves under existential risk. I put myself at existential risk earlier when I crossed the street, right? The Adrian, or the whoever this bloke is, are putting themselves at some kind of risk. 
And we can think about existential risk just by picking out different entities that we happen to care about. I think people here who care about conservation have been thinking about existential risk for a long time, right? They don't just care about the number of species or the cost that comes from losing the species. They care about particular entities no longer existing. The interesting cases of existential risk, of course, are the big ones, right? So here's a nice, you always got to have an Einstein quote when you're doing a talk. So here's my Einstein quote. Also, this is weirdly past this quote. I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. What he's not saying here is if there is a third world war, all the humans will go extinct. What he's saying is if there is a third world war, we will lose a whole bunch of things that we think are very, very important about the human species. Things about culture and technology and art and so on and so forth. And so we can think about existential risk in terms of the loss of certain things about cultures and civilizations that we care about. So if you care about existential risk, I think, for instance, you might care about the loss of various languages. And of course, you know, the world exploding. And that's what we're going to focus on. <laughs> right, what we're interested in is existential risk at the species level. So what are the things that might be risks at the species level? Well, there's a very terrible way of distinguishing between the two. Um, two types, and I'm going to continue that terrible way because it's easy. We can think about things that are done to us that in some sense aren't really our fault. For instance, if there was a major solar flare, I don't know if this is technically an existential risk, but it's really cool anyway. So just to get a sense, things on the sun are really big. So solar flare, size of Earth, pretty big. Um, if there were a major solar flare now, roughly what would happen is everyone who's on an airplane would be dead which I think is about 600,000 people, which is small beans. But all of our space tech will get knocked out. Right? Every single one of our thingy-bobs in space telling us how to find out where we are will be knocked out. We're depending increasingly on that kind of technology. And if you're quite pasty like myself, um, you might also be worried because the ozone layer will be gone in an instant. It'll come back pretty quickly, but still. right? So that's kind of fun. Others, you know, big rocks hitting the Earth, super volcanoes, right? It seems like the history of the Earth and the history of the solar system gives us a record of really big, bad, nasty things happening to us. And, you know, if one of those things happened, low probability, but could happen, that would put us in a bad place. But the really interesting existential risks are things that we do to ourselves. And in part, the things that make these interesting is because we couldn't really do these things to ourselves until relatively recently, right? Our technology does seem to be increasing in power at this kind of massive rate. And I don't need to talk about fancy robots to talk about that. I just need to talk about what's happened since the beginning of the 20th century, since the beginning of the 19th century. Human technology and changes in human societies, which is a kind of technology, have massively increased our capacity to affect the world around us. So let's go through the kind of things. So of course there's the AI one, which often for some reason is this idea that what AI will want to do is like enslave us for some reason. I think because we have this idea that if something's smarter than us, it has more authority than us or something. But I kind of like the stories where a super intelligence is just going to kill us out of indifference rather than anything else. Not just indifference, also bad programming might matter. So the classic example of bad programming, of course, is Mickey in The Sorcerer's Apprentice. So the sorcerer gives Mickey a task, put the water out of the well and put it in the palace. Um, the people here know about this, like, yes, yes. Um, what Mickey does is he gets the magic hat, and he, I'm sure there's a better term for that. Sorcerer's hat, imagine. Pointy hat. Pointy hat, pointy hat. good. He gets the point, I'm from Cambridge, we know all about pointy yeah. hats. Um, he gets the magic pointy hat, and he animates the um, brooms, and he gives them a very simple kind of instruction, which is pull water to the well. Of course, Mickey's an awful programmer, and forgets to tell them to stop at any point, and they end up flooding the place. There are kind of more fancy sci-fi versions of this, fancy, most famously the Grey Goose scenario, where effectively you create a kind of nanobot. What the nanobot does is it takes organic material and it makes a new nanobot. And then that new nanobot takes organic material and makes another new nanobot. Um, until, you know, the entire Earth is just these little nanomachines. If you play, there's a great game where you roughly end up doing this with paper clips that's recently been released, which you should all play. It's very fun in a weird I'm killing all the humans to create paperclips kind of way. Um, interestingly, this was first introduced by someone pointing out how moronic this idea is, and it looks like engineering solutions to this are going to be quite easy. But the worry is 
It might be easy to create something that's not going to do this, but if you're malevolent, it might be quite easy to create something that does do this. So one of the things we always have to worry about about our new powerful technology is that it's always going to be dual use. The more cool the thing I create is, the more nasty someone else can make it be. And this is why we should really worry. As our technology amps up, the capacity for doing nasty shit with it also amps up. And so we have a sort of usual rogues gallery of things that on the one hand have this capacity to be enormously transformative, to make our lives and, you know, all of the humans and maybe the animals and the plants too, in so much of a better situation in certain ways, like nanotechnology, certain types of gene editing, these look really powerful. And so we want to be able to grasp the benefits we can take from this technology. But as it gets more powerful, so it gets more dangerous. Here's another, here's a new thing which I saw a couple of articles on. Uh, apparently, US, the US Army is working on um, a self-aware squid-like robot you can 3D print in the field. Which on the one hand is totally awesome, and on the other hand is like, what? <laughs> it also makes you think, this is what the US Army is choosing to communicate with the journalists about. So what in fact are they doing? So existential risk is roughly a risk, let's think about it as a risk to a human species or a human civilization. Something which I think is problematic about the way that I've just talked about existential risk and the way that most existential risk researchers talk about it is it's thought as if there's this kind of magic bullet. There's this one shot, great big rocks hit the earth, the AIs become super robots and for some reason enslave us, there's kind of one hit. And I think that's a very simplistic way of thinking about existential risk. So let me give you an example, which I'm sure you're not going to be surprised that I'm talking about. So some people have complained that existential risk doesn't care much, people in the X-risk field don't care much about climate change. You can kind of see why projections for death on climate change are like, I don't know, 500 million? Which is a lot, I'll grant you. It's a lot of people, right? But if you care about the whole human species, you're like, man, I can take that hit. I don't think we can. <laughs> right? Because when we're thinking about the survival of a species, as any ecologist will tell you, what you're interested in is the resilience of a particular kind of system. And things like climate change and various other kinds of, you know, world scale kind of effects can massively affect the resilience of systems. So for instance, what happens when we get this hockey stick? Well, the temperatures go up in various weird chaotic ways. If the temperatures go up, what happens? Well, of course, we get some flooded cities. Okay, well, we have to move some people. Well, that's kind of bad, right? We suddenly have hundreds of millions of people who are displaced. What happens if you have hundreds of millions of people who are displaced? Well, this is very cheery, by the way. Um, <laughs> you then have um, a massively increased chance of pandemics. If you've got a massive increase in, in pandemics, you get more of this happening, right? These things are going to be feeding back into each other in worrying kinds of ways. These are not situations that lend themselves to stable, friendly political situations, right? History doesn't tell us that disasters lead to cooperation. Disasters, in this case, often lead to certain types of authoritarian governments. And it turns out that authoritarian governments don't last for very long in problematic kinds of ways. Um, in addition to this, raising sea levels as well as increased temperature are going to increase the amount of um, disasters, like just normal disasters like desertification, droughts, tsunamis, that puts further pressure on these kinds of cities. And of course, we've got biodiversity collapsing at the same time, and we have no idea to what extent human glo the global systems that humans depend upon are dependent upon things like panda bear or bees or pick your favorite kind of animal. And so it's actually pretty easy to draw a scenario where from something which on the face of it is bad from a like, I care that lots of people are dying, <laughs> to being bad to a shit, the human race is now in trouble. And so if you care about existential risk, I think you need to care quite profoundly at very local kinds of things because these things can scaffold up. Um, also, uh, we should care about the nuclear bombs because Presumably, during question time, someone will say, what's the most likely way we'll go extinct? It's, it's that. It's not very interesting, but there's lots of these. <laughs> They're bad. <laughs> there's nothing really to say about that. <laughs> okay. So if you're trying to know about existential risk, I'm a philosopher of science. What I'm interested in is, okay, how do we know about that? And in this case, it's a good question to ask, because if we can have some knowledge of these events, it seems like we might be able to tell how to avoid them. It seems good, right? It's something that we might want. But it turns out knowing about them is incredibly hard. Here are some reasons why. First off, 
a lot of them are unique, right? So the natural ones are easy from this perspective, right? I can look at the geological record, I can look at space and be like, hey look, big rocks hit the earth. How often do they hit the earth? What happens when they hit the earth? I can get access to that information. I can't look at the history of the earth and say, so how often had superintelligence arisen? Right? One, even if they had, it's not clear to me that there'd be a signal. <laughs> you know, it looks like I can't get data on these kinds of questions, which makes it very hard to do traditional science on it. In addition to being unique, they're also, of course, large-scale and heterogeneous. That wonderful picture I painted you of all of civilization collapsing as a result of climate change involved a whole bunch of different systems, economic systems, ecological systems, climate systems, geological systems, all fucking up together in a glorious explosion. And it's very hard to get traction on chaotic systems. We can understand a chaotic system maybe, but trying to understand two chaotic systems that are interdependent is really hard. The computers get very sad when we try and do that work. Right? So it's very hard to do science in this case. Also, there's, I'm a philosopher, so I'm gonna say second, second order ignorance about this, but if you want, you can just call it unknown unknowns, which makes me sad, but if you want. Roughly, with, with existential risks, we kind of know what some of them might be, but we don't know what the space ultimately is. I don't know. So there was a dinosaur comic um, a couple of years ago that went as follows. It pointed out that one of the things that the humans have done has sent things like, I think, like the Challenger spacecraft, like out of the solar system. And they say, well, imagine there are lots and lots of human-like civilizations. They're probably sending spaceships, probes out into the solar system. That they're just like, if there's enough of them, there's a small but real chance that one of them could just collide with Earth. I was like, shit, that's like a new existential risk I'd never really thought of before. Very, very low probability, but if it happens, very, very bad thing, right? How many things have we not thought of that are the kind of things that might make us go extinct? Again, very hard to do a science of that. Another thing that I think makes it really hard is what I'm gonna call being in the public eye. As we started with, right, we started with this, the way that the Daily Mail reports on this stuff. If you're trying to do serious science, on things like human extinction, people are gonna pay attention. And sometimes people paying attention makes things really hard because they might pay too much attention, right? At which point, so I take it, hopefully none of you want to hide under your couches the rest of eternity because the things I've described are low probability other than the nuclear war thing and the climate change thing. Most of the things are low probability, but we wanna know about them just in case, right? So we shouldn't hide under our chairs about this, but because it's so striking, because it's got this kind of excitingness to it, we have a tendency to pay too much attention. And then two things happen. They pay too much attention and doing a science of this is hard, it's hard to tell whether we've won, there's gonna be a whole lot of false positives, a whole lot of false negatives, and the public are like, well, you just keep saying things that aren't gonna happen, so we don't care. Right? Or they're gonna to care too much and panic. And as we're about to spend ages talking about, this really matters for how science works. So what does the science of existential risk look like? Well, in a lot of ways it looks different from the way that actual normal practicing science looks like because of those features. It's going to be very, very, very speculative. Right? So famously, the philosopher Karl Popper says something like, good science sticks its neck out, it makes bold hypotheses. If you're trying to work out what you might know about an area about which you know very little, it's crucially important to be able to go, this thing? Because once you say this thing, you can then work out how to test it. You can work out how to find evidence. And so a science of this existential risk is going to be highly speculative. Related to that, it's going to be extremely creative. It's not going to be the kind of science where you sit in a lab very carefully just putting another little brick in a wall. It's going to be much more scattershot. Again, very different to the way the science usually looks. It's also going to be diverse in two senses. It's going to be diverse in terms of topic, right? Learning about AI taking over the world versus learning about big rocks hitting the earth look a bit different to me, right? It's a real hodgepodge of things that we care about. And diverse in terms of discipline, right? The center I'm in is hideously multidisciplinary. We have lawyers and ecologists and philosophers and virologists and, you know, this, which is quite unique actually. You know, the academy is not good at fostering multidisciplinarity and we're gonna kind of need that. I think also this kind of science is gonna challenge the way that successful science usually looks. Successful science usually has precise results. It usually has statistical significance, or what philosophers would sometimes call confirmation. 
But if you have no idea or very little idea about what the space of ideas look like, then actually you shouldn't expect to get these sorts of things. So I think if we want to have a serious academic science of existential risk, we need to change what scientific success looks like. Here's a simple way of thinking about the point I'm making, something like this. Imagine you have your research space. Here are all the things <laughs> that you might study regarding existential risk. It's quite a big space, right? How do I want to spread my scientists? Well, I want to spread them thin, right? Something like that, right? I want to have them overlap, of course, but broadly spread thin. The problem is, that's not what science looks like. Science looks like this. Science is designed to find the best ideas and get people to cluster on those good ideas and then slowly work their way out. If you don't believe me, wait five or 10 minutes and then you'll believe me. Right? The incentive structures of science are set up to cluster scientists. And often this is a good thing. I'm about to say a bunch of things about science. Again, remember tough love. I'm about to say a bunch of things about science which suggest they're bad things. I don't think they're bad things all the time. I think there are bad things when you are in the sort of situation when you're thinking about existential risk. We need to be creative. So why is science like this? Well, if you were to go and talk to a philosopher or a sociologist or an historian of science, they would point to three things. I'll give you the three things, then I'll give you the Adrian version of it. So here's the first one. Science has become professionalized. So here's a scientist in the mid 19th century. Massive bonus points, anyone know who that is? No, it's William Buckland, and you should look him up, he's hilarious. So he's a geologist, sort of. Um, one thing I love about the Victorians is that they're really into geology, and they used to dress like this, and they're going out and doing it, put on your hat. Go out. There were a few women geologists that go out and do their thing. Um, one thing to note about people like Buckland is that they're, by and large, men of leisure. They have lots of money, they're gentlemen scholars. They can do whatever the hell they want. Now, there are some things about science which are much, much better. So here's, I guess, what science looks like today, right? One immediate advantage is that you have people who aren't William Buckland doing it. You have women, you have people of color, you have a much wider variety of people who are involved in science, but it's become exhaust fumes, but it's become much, much more professionalized. And when something's professionalized, as I'm gonna talk about in a second, it becomes much more tied in to certain types of power structures and tied into certain types of ways of thinking. We're going to spend more time on that in a second. Another way that science has changed, and particularly in the US since the Second World War, is the funding has become by and large centralized. And so if you want to get money as a scientist, you have to get money either from large corporations or from the government, particularly in the States, this is true in the EU, so on and so forth. And there was sort of supposed to be something which opened science up. It was supposed to make scientists more free, um, but it kind of didn't. Here's a quote. Today's free intellectuals, this is back in 1990, things if anything have gotten worse, do not play freely, but instead find themselves tethered to national goals for health, defense, economic competitiveness, and so on. Colleges, universities, and research institutes have come to depend on federal research support. And this is a dependence that is transmitted and amplified to the scientists and scholars they employ, which limits, its, limits free play, right? You have to jump over and through a bunch of hoops in order to be a scientist. And so these things get kind of transmitted in various sorts of ways. Finally, science has gotten big, right? So this is CERN. If you're like, I don't know if CERN has a boss, let's imagine, CERN has the Emperor of CERN. The Emperor of CERN has many, many people who depend upon the Emperor of CERN. And so the decisions that the Emperor of CERN makes are really important. And that suggests that the Emperor of CERN is gonna make some pretty conservative decisions. He can't afford, or she, hopefully, can't afford to fuck up, right? This is a beautiful quote from Hirsch. There's something weirdly hierarchical about the new architecture of the scientific community. What was before kind of like some small villages is now an urban high rise with big offices at the top and a lot of cubicles down below. Why does that matter? Well, I am technically a millennial, just, and I don't like old people. I think it's reasonable to think that with some exceptions, old people tend to be set in their ways, tend to be less creative. When you have this kind of system, one, if you're a nice person, you'd be conservative because people depend on you, but also, you have to be old in order to get this much responsibility. I can show you with evidence, look. 
So this is NSF grants. These are grants from the National Science Foundation. Here we have number of awardees. Here we have year. 1979, the number of awardees who are under the age of 35 are 1,100. But 2003, 200. Right? The age you have to be in order to be a scientist who's a PI, in other words, has your own money, has your own lab, can do what you want to control research direction, is getting older and older and older. If you think that we need creativity in science, this is disastrous, at least on my view. Okay, let's kind of wrap this worrying about science up by taking you through the career of a scientist. So you're a scientist. There you are. So to become a scientist, I take it you do a degree. What happens when you do a degree? Well, to be honest, they get you to do like kind of the same problems over and over and over again for three or four years. And then you have exams where you say, yes, I can do that problem. Yes, I can do that problem. What that does is that teaches you what a problem looks like, and what a solution looks like. You learn a bunch of skills, you learn a bunch of facts, but you also learn how to recognize a certain type of problem set. If you don't believe me, find two scientists from different disciplines and talk for them for, at them for a bit. And the way they approach problems are quite different. Right? This is because of the socialization process. Then you have to start like publishing right? if you want to have a career. And to publish, you have to go through peer review, which means convincing the people who have gone through the same educational system of you, as you to think your work is good. So you have to please them. So it makes it very hard for you to do something that's pushing back or breaking out of that way of doing science. You just need to get money, which of course is also peer-reviewed, right? Scientific funding is also peer-reviewed, so this further pushes it in. Is anyone here who's a working scientist or considers himself as such? Okay, good. Scientists are bastards. If you hung out, if you hang out with scientists, and in fact, this is true of all academics, the amount of gossiping that goes on is enormous, and that gossiping plays a really important social role. There's certain types of gatekeeping that scientists do all the time. They're always talking about different students, they're talking about different labs, and that matters because in science, reputation is crucial. If you get a reputation for being maybe a crank or a maverick, you'll be very quickly excluded from those groups. Right? Again, pushing you towards conservativeness. The public also matters. Sometimes the public likes you, sometimes they don't like you too much. And particularly scientists who are working at the cutting edge of technology are very aware that if public or policymakers get the wrong view of you, you're fucked. They know that. You can tell it when they're talking to the media. They're terrified when they're talking to the media because, as we'll talk about later, there are lots of examples where you need an ambulance. Or fire truck. Ah! Fire trucks sound wrong in this country. Uh, finally, you need money from lots of places. <laughs> right? You're not just getting money based on peer review, you're also talking to industry, you're talking to um, the government, and they all have various types of agendas and they all shape what you're doing. Here's where summarizing this. Of British, British I think this is right, British academics with science PhDs, roughly a third of them say that they want to have academic careers. Of the, say, per 100 who get PhDs, two or three of them get academic careers. It's ludicrously competitive. If you're in that kind of environment, every decision you make is a high stakes. stakes thank you, Nicole. A high stakes bet. If you're making high stakes bets, you're not going to go risky. You're going to pick the conservative. You're going to pick the safe. And as I said, often, well, I really think science should be better than this, but often that makes science very, very productive but it also makes it very, very conservative. And if we care about this increasing power that our technology has, we should be profoundly worried about the extent to which science is drawn towards certain types of conservatism. So, modern science just is bad at being revolutionary. It's not just me saying it. Lots of philosophers you don't care about think this. Hey. It's bad at generating novel, revolutionary, creative ideas. But with things like existential risk, we need those things. Right? So that's bad. OK, how much time have I got? How are we going? Uh, 10, 15 minutes. Perfect. OK, now what I'm going to do is completely change the subject. And then I'm going to tie it back in in a way that we can go, oh. So completely changing the subject. I think stories matter. <laughs> now, often, people say things like, I think stories matter. They say things like, 
humans are narrative animals or something like this. And they say these things that are like, I think deep is an insult. They say deep things. I think stories matter in a very simplistic, straightforward way. And it's because of just this. The world is this hideously complex, difficult, messy fucking place, and we are useless little monkeys, right? And so we have to simplify things in order to even get out of bed in the morning, in order to navigate the world. We need ways of foregrounding certain things and backgrounding other things. When I was crossing the street, I was foregrounding the cars and I was backgrounding the pigeons, right? What a story does is it, out of the blue complexity, picks out a bunch of things and says, these things are salient, these are the things that matter. When someone says stories are important, they're not saying something airy-fairy or fancy. They're saying something very straightforward. You can't pay attention to all the things. And what a story does is it gives you a way of paying attention to the relevant salient things. A good story in this case, right? Sometimes there are good stories that let you pay attention to things you otherwise wouldn't. I guess there are probably bad stories as well, but let's not worry about that. Actually, no, we're going to talk about that in a second. Let's imagine you agree with me about that. Okay, stories are necessary for understanding and navigating the way the world works. It seems like some of us have access to different stories than other people. So we need narratives to navigate the complexity of the world. I happen to think that I'm someone who's very, very lucky because I have a fuck ton of narratives, right? And here I'm doing that thing where I say I'm very, very privileged. I'm ludicrously privileged. As you may have noticed, I'm a white, middle-class, tallish, confident dude. So. There are very few constraints that I myself put on myself and society puts on me as I navigate through the world. For instance, I became a fucking academic philosopher. At no point did I stop and go, is this a thing I can do? Sure, I can do it, right? This doesn't mean that people who have less narratives attached to them can't do these things, but it means they have to overcome more in various ways. If you agree that we need narratives to navigate the complexity of the world, then it seems that the kind of narratives that are available to you, both to yourself in your head and the ones that are projected on you from society, shape your life in various kinds of ways. This is going to get tied back to what I was talking about, don't worry. <laughs> this is going to make perfect sense in a second. And so it seems like people who are in, let's say, impoverished narrative situations can overcome that but it's much, much, much harder. It's one of the classic cases which I kind of like. Here I'm drawing on, by the way, a philosopher called Miranda Fricker. She calls this um, humanitic injustice, but I don't know what humanitic means, so I go with narrative. Maybe someone can tell me in Christian time. Um, she gives the example of um, a woman in an office in the 1950s who's being sexually harassed. Now, if you're a woman in an office in the 1950s being sexually harassed, of course, that's horrible. Like, I've been sexually harassed, I didn't like it. I haven't been systematically sexually harassed, so maybe I don't quite know. Um, but also, the concept of being sexually harassed kind of isn't there, right? So it's not just that you're oppressed, it's also that you don't have the concepts in order to understand what that thing is. Similarly, if you're in a culture or in a society where you don't have very many narratives, that can really affect the way your life goes. Okay. So what narratives are available to us make a difference to the kind of lives both we allow ourselves to live and what the people around us will allow us to live. That seems to me pretty solid. And so we can have a notion called narrative injustice or humanitic injustice, which says a kind of injustice is because of the type of critter you are, the type of person you have, you can have less opportunity, less narratives around you in that sense. Again, nothing deterministic here. Of course these things can be overcome, and of course you can waste your time with all the narratives in the world. But still, it makes a difference. I think that is true of technology as well. I think that technologies also have narratives about them. And those narratives can be richer and more useful, or they can be impoverished and problematic. And when those technologies are incredibly powerful and have great possibility for benefit and great possibility for the opposite of benefit, bad things, then if those narratives are impoverished, we should be worried. And I think that artificial intelligence is a great example of a technology which has some really shitty narratives about it. So let's think about those shitty narratives. There's two ways of thinking about this. One is the narratives that are internal to the scientists, right? We're not going to worry about that today because apparently none of us are scientists, which is great. We're going to worry about the human narratives. If you think what I'm saying seems wrong, think about genetic modifi modified food or organisms in Europe. 
right? That's a technology, maybe good, maybe bad, don't know, but it got attached to a certain type of narrative about multiculturalism, about globalism, about corporatization, and in virtue of that, it became very hard to do that kind of research in Europe. Stem cells in the US, ditto. It got attached to things about um, pro-choice versus pro-life. It became very hard to do that kind of research. That's one of the reasons why scientists doing this kind of work in this vicinity, geoengineers are a great example, are very careful about their PR because they do not want to end up in these places. So what are our narratives about AI like? Well, I sort of already told you, right? When you have a thing in the media, you, you got this little fella. There he is. Hi. Right. I kind of love the Terminator as an image, right? I can like go on about, you know, it's got this, there's something really funky about this where it's kind of got this human-y thing, right? It's a hominid, you know, and it's got the skeletal thing, but it's also the other. It's very, ooh, you can tell lots of fancy literature things about the power of this image. But it's really hard to get something published in the media without having a fucking Terminator put on it. So a friend of mine, Beth Singler, has been collecting these for a number of years, and I'll give you a few. So here's one from um, the founding of the center I'm part of. There's Arnie. Hi, Arnie. Um, here is, uh, do you fear AI taking over? This one's great. A third of people believe computers will threat, will steal their jobs. If, unless they're like assassins from the future, I don't think that's relevant, right? <laughs> Uh, this one I love in particular, you know, Elon Musk aims to save the world from evil AI. This says, um, the FLI, the Future of Life Institute, said things such as Terminator misrepresent the problem. <laughs> Why are you putting a fucking Terminator there then? <laughs> right? Again, what keeps up? There's an AI. There's another one. This one is also great. So here's um, uh, Martin Rees, who's one of the people who founded Caesar. Um, this one of the great things is, uh, Lord Rees, right, in case you were wondering, like, the formal head of, of the Royal Society is that one, not, not that one, right, and so on and so forth, right? It's incredibly difficult to get something in the media without it having a Terminator plastered on it, and of course it makes sense. If you're a journalist, you've got people going through this stuff, and you need to get the most gripping image you can, and the most gripping image you can is often, like, this sort of shit, right? This kind of death robot. It's gri gripping. I, I bet most of the people who see that don't read the article. And a lot of these articles are talking very sensible things about AI safety. But no one reads about that. And as I've already seen, that matters, right? Public naive perceptions of these technologies really, really matter. If they're just seeing a bunch of death robots, that's going to make them misunderstand the sorts of things we should worry about when we're worrying about AI. Here are two quick examples. Oh, there's another one. There's another one. <laughs> there's so many of these things. Go away. OK. So here's one worry. Terminators are kind of embodied. They're robots. They lead you to think about artificial intelligence as being something like an agent. When I think a lot of the ways that we should worry about artificial intelligence, if you guys work in tech, it's not like a machine learning algorithm or something like that is like an agent or a robot. Right? The sorts of things that are be running the infrastructure of our cities the next 10 to 15, 20 years aren't even little red glowing eyes like how. They're just some distributed fucking thing. Right? They're not quite agents in quite the same way that Terminator is. The things that are running a lot of our economic systems are not robots on the trading floor. Right? They're disembodied in various ways. And so if the public and politicians are thinking about AI as dangerous robots, they're not going to fund the right thing. They're not going to encourage the right kind of research. Another problem is that, as you may have noticed, the Terminator stories are a little bit dystopian. <laughs> Just a trifle. When people talk about AI, they tend to go one of two ways. Either it's Skynet or it's luxury space communism, where you're you know, playing the harp with Spock in this kind of weird kind of alternative reality. Now, I kind of like to end up there, that would be nice, but we shouldn't really expect it. Dystopias and utopias don't really turn up. Dystopias and utopias tell us more about us than they do about the future. And it strikes me as deeply worrying. We're at a time where we should be having the richest possible stories about the various things this technology can do, the richest set of narratives that we might be able to use to understand, examine, and move into the future. We're stuck in these utopias and these dystopias. And I think that's incredibly worrying. And so I think that at least one thing I'd like to sort of take from this 
is just don't use the Terminator anymore. Like if you're a journalist, if you have control of, you know, if you're reading a newspaper and you see a Terminator, try and pay no attention, right? I don't think it's helpful and I think it's actually actively damaging our capacity to think about artificial intelligence because it makes people who work in artificial intelligence terrified of talking about safety and we need them to talk about and work on safety. Not me, I don't know anything about how it works, so I'm not very helpful there. But we need to encourage them, and that's how we should do it. So, technological outcomes are not inevitable. This is something that's been running out from underneath this. People often have this idea that technology is somehow determined and you can't stop it. That's clearly bullshit, right? We have at least in part a choice about the direction that a technology takes. Here's this, this we in this kind of giant sense, right? I individually probably don't, but maybe as a group. I think it's plausible that the stories we tell, the narratives we tell, and the futures we imagine make a difference to how that technology might develop and, in fact, how prepared we might be for those possible futures. And so if we have narrative injustice in technology, that's extraordinarily problematic, right? This is how important these kind of technologies are. They're so important that stories matter, which is kind of surprising. The last thing I want to just sort of point out, and this is more just a general point, about thinking about the future of technology is I, I'm usually someone who doesn't like having principles, but I've decided I do have one principle which is as follows. And it's going back to, remember this thing? The uh, self-aware squid-like robot you can 3D print in the field. If the little eight-year-old boy that lives inside Adrian sees your military technology and goes, fuck yeah, do not develop it under any circumstances. <laughs> Thank you very much.